Joining us today is Professor Martin Jones, who's a professor of human performance and uh, a, a doctorate in sports psychology, and currently just about to get his master's in sleep medicine from Oxford University. Martin, how the hell are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yet another overachiever on the podcast. I had one on on Sunday night, and now I've got you. This is, I don't know what's going on here, but it's, it's, you guys are fun to talk to because they're very inspiring. And uh, the, what I'm dying to get into is the, the sleep aspect, because you're now a, a proper sleep expert, and I think that's going to be a popular subject for people to listen to. And certainly, I have a lot of questions to ask about it. So how did you get into this game? Well, I started about 20 years ago on a path to become a PE teacher. So uh, yeah, I always, I always enjoyed teaching. I, I thought I'd be an educator. So I went to university thinking that I'd be a PE teacher. And somewhere down that road, I discovered sports psychology and started to think, well, maybe this, there's something in this. Could there be a profession, a job um, in, in sports psychology? So I ended up doing a, a master's degree at Loughborough which led into a PhD. Uh, and then that took me across to Canada where I worked for a few years at a university. And while I was no longer sort of aiming to be a PE teacher, I ended up being effectively a, a teacher of sorts because I, I taught within universities uh, for many, many years doing research, consulting, um, uh, and, and all the things that, that come with working in a university. And, um, and, and loved that, to be honest. I, I loved working with students. I, I loved teaching found it very, very fulfilling. And it was only um, so 2018-ish, I guess it was, uh, 2017, uh, a job advert came up um, within the UK Ministry of Defence. And I'd previously taught a an individual from the Royal Marines. He'd come up to the university that I was working at at the time uh, to do a master's degree. And I'd had some exposure to that world and um, working with him um, to, to help him complete his master's degree and, and visited Limston a few times and, and saw that. So when this job came up in the MOD, I kind of thought, well, this is interesting. It's a slightly different performance realm. I'd, I'd worked in sport predominantly up to that point, up to that point, uh, a lot, a lot of youth sport, working with Olympian level athletes, that kind of thing. And I thought, the military sounds it was in, was intriguing it was it was different um so i went for that job um speculatively didn't didn't really think i'd get it to be honest and um was lucky enough to be offered the position and started working as as a as a full-time researcher within the ministry of defense uh, in the uk and did that for for five and a half ish years and um, working in every every corner of the military that you can imagine, um, every service, every fighting arm, and, and really looking at how you can use the science uh, of uh, the, the athletes are using, how we can take sports science and apply that into defense. And how can we use those the similar principles uh, to, to optimize the performance of, of the people in defense? Hmm. And so you've left the MOD now, you're in, you've got your own private practice, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, tell me what you've got to give us the name. Give us a website, give us your socials, everywhere that people can find you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's Optimizing Human Performance. Uh, so it's uh, www.ophp.co.uk. And you can find, uh, you can if you just type OPHP, you can probably find it on, on me on LinkedIn and, um, and Instagram. And you, I found you on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter as well. Yeah, yeah. Or I just X. joined Twitter or X. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I just joined that myself. Yeah, uh, I'm trying. I think that's probably a good platform to start on because I, I, I'm not too keen. I, I think I've been shadow banned. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, also, yeah, if you want to go on Instagram, Mister Kindness underscore Pod and Mister Kindness on X as well. So there you go. Give me a follow, and that would be uh, that would be great. Anyway, so how did you? Where did the interest in sleep come from? So that th this was a it was a it was a strange turn in the road to be honest. Because now I look back on it and think it's unbelievable that I'd never studied sleep. Now I kind of see it through a different lens and appreciate how valuable sleep is. It it's genuinely surprising, if not even shocking, that I was never taught it as a sports scientist. My first degree was in sports science, so I did psychology 
physiology, biomechanics, learning about the human body, about the various physiological systems and psychological and social systems. And we never, never learn about sleep ever. And when you think if you live to the age of 90, 30 years of your lifespan will be spent asleep. And, and, and none of that was ever discussed in my sports science degree. So how I came to it through working in defense was a, a bit of a broader question. So we, we, the research that I was doing was fundamentally trying to help people. I mean, that, that's, that's my, my sort of foundation is the reason I do what I do is I want to help people. And that, that's what I, my, I get um, fulfillment from helping. So we were looking at how do you help people in defense? How do you help people in specific jobs? And there are certain roles or certain jobs which are demanding cognitively, physically, um, for various reasons. So we were specifically looking at, at, at prolonged, cognitively demanding tasks that people in, in defense and security roles do. The kind of thing you can you can imagine, things that are, are monotonous maybe, they take a long time. You might be looking at the same thing over and over again until you suddenly see a little blip on the screen, which is important. But they're, they're cognitively demanding because there's a, there's a fatigue element, there's a time on task element. And the question is, well, how do you get people better at that? How do you improve someone's performance? So we started looking at lots of different things and there's loads of technologies that are potentially available. Uh, for example, you can stimulate various parts of the brain. You can use um, electrical stimulation. You can use magnetic field, magnetic stimulation to, to activate certain parts of the brain. And they work, they do work. There are certain supplements, there are certain pharmaceutical agents, again, that, that, that do different things. So for example, if someone's got like ADHD, like a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, there are drugs that can help um, that change the chemistry of the brain. Could they be used to help people on these prolonged tasks? So we, we, we really looked, looked at lots of different things, lots of different possibilities. And whilst a lot of these things are effective, they do work, the effect size, like how effective they are, uh, is quite small. They, don't, they, they do work, but not very well, if that if that's the right way of putting it. But what, what then I stumbled across and started talking to some people about is if you look at somebody who is sleep deprived compared to when they're not sleep deprived, the, the, the effect size is enormous. So if you can if you can help people get rested, their cognitive performance improves significantly more than any of those those are the technologies. So the question that I asked myself at the time was, wh what's the value in these technologies or these pharmaceuticals? If someone's sleep deprived, surely that's the thing that's going to improve their cognitive performance the most. So if you take somebody who's maybe sleeping four hours a night and just give them a longer sleep opportunities and, and increase in the quality of their sleep and the quantity of their sleep, that that will improve their performance to a, to a greater extent than the hacks, what we think of as, 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 as hacks, like the technologies, the, the pharmaceuticals, the supplements. So that, that's where it started. And then it was just a deep dive into, into, into sleep. And it soon became apparent that there's a whole world out there of, of, of sleep. It's incredibly complicated and, and that's where I thought, you know what, I need, I need to do a deep dive into this. So that's why I, I ended up doing the master's degree at Oxford to, to upskill and, and make sure I knew what I was talking about. Well, fair enough. But I didn't even know that such departments existed at university. So this, did... this is the only one, in, I think, the only one in the world or, or maybe one of the only ones in the world that's, um, does a, it's definitely the only one in the UK currently that does a, uh, that's a sleep uh, master's degree. It's very niche. Hmm. Interesting, though, because you tell you talk about when you work with the forces, people in the forces, and I find that very ironic because all of our training is done and they make sure that you're as sleep deprived as you possibly can be. And I mean, I understand why they're trying because they're, they're mimicking the real life situation for us where you're probably going to be super tired, exhausted, well, not super tired, beyond super tired. You've been up for days and uh, mentally and physically exhausted. And you might, I mean, one, you know, you might get 10 hours in five days. You might get, you might go two days, maybe more without any sleep. 
and you know, you've the funniest thing for me, and you should know, you probably know a lot about this, Martin, is the the hallucinations. Have you ever, have you ever experienced, well, necessarily experienced, have you heard some good stories about this? Because this is oh, a yeah. personal favorite <laughs> hundreds, of mine. <laughs> hundreds. Yeah. There's uh, hallucinations. It's, it's that you have individual differences, which is how, uh, based on, you know, how much sleep dep deprivation you can actually handle. But some people hallucinate within 24 hours. So, you know, you wake up at seven in the morning, push through that, that whole day, that whole night. Some people are hallucinating by seven o'clock the following morning. Yeah, because from my recollection of it, we it was it was weird because for me, you know, you you shut your eyes for two seconds and you it felt like you'd gone instantly into REM sleep, you know, because you you were instantly dreaming. For me, so I was not sure what was re reality or if I was dreaming or if I was awake. And the other thing I, I found that because of that, I wasn't sure if it was actually hallucinations or I just my body had shut off and I'd fallen asleep. But so I don't know. What's is that something you? <laughs> we were do very very tired. Yeah, it could it could you could have just but you probably had what we call a micro sleep. So um, yeah, you, you, your body you have literally just fallen asleep. But yeah, the, the hallucination. I've, I've 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 heard lots of stories from different areas, not just defense. I mean, I, I, I've supported a few people who've rode across the Atlantic, and you know, I've heard stories of people in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, they're, they're on a, they, they tend to operate on, on a, on a shift pattern, like a two on, two off. So two on, on the two hours on the oars, two hours resting, probably not sleeping, but not, not rowing. And, um, you know, I've heard people saying you know, they're in the middle, middle of the Atlantic and they look across and there's their grandma riding a bike <laughs> next to them, like in the middle of the ocean and, you know, people, so uh, some some seriously worrying to places where people hallucinate in in the world of defense you think you know safety critical roles um where people hallucinate it's you know it's it does absolutely. happen absolutely we we had loaded weapons you know live ammunition on live ranges and having we were supposed to get 8 hours sleep the night before you go on the range that was that was one of the rules but they'd always managed to bugger you around somehow that you wouldn't get the eight hour of sleep. And we were, I mean, this is at the end of maybe four or five days or sometimes 10 days worth of very intensive stuff. And so anyway, that, I'm, I'm not going to mm -hmm. name and shame, but it was, <laughs> it was, it's not ideal. But so how would you, how on earth do you overcome such a fundamental need as sleep when you've been sleep, de sleep deprived on purpose? Yeah. And how do you, how would you go about maintaining some sort of, cognitive ability it's it's difficult because because sleep is a basic biological need um if we and if we think about what are our basic biological needs well we need warmth and, and if you if you don't maintain warmth you, you die you need hydration so you need water um if you don't have water you die you need air and um, you need food or you know you need um, something some energy moving into your body if you don't have that you die and you need sleep and if you don't have sleep you don't sustain life so those are basic biological needs and it, it's funny that you're saying in the in in some areas it's this the the saying is well this is how we'll operate this we will work in a we will go on for on deployment and you'll be sleep deprived so therefore we need to train in that way because it mimics the the world that we're going to go in I understand that logic and I don't necessarily disagree with it entirely, but my question to them is, well, does that mean that if um, you, you'd send somebody out into you know the, the Brecon beacons with no water or no food? Because when you're on deployment, you might not have water or food. You know, if you're in a, an escape and evasion sort of scenario, you won't have. So should we train for that? Should we should we put people without food? Should we give people inadequate clothing because they might not have it when they're on deployment? So you know, I can understand some logic, but the reality is that the evidence is so strong that shows that sleep is is fundamental to our performance. And, and when I say performance, we can talk about lots of things, but if we think about our our cognitive performance predominantly, so our decision making, our reaction time, our ability to learn to retain and recall information they they're all undermined when we're sleep deprived so what i try and do is bang that drum to say well if if 
sometimes you need to be sleep deprived and you know i'm not i'm not one of those people who advocates or, or you know there's some terms of like sleep gurus or sleep evangelists who are saying you must get eight hours if you don't you're going to get alzheimer's disease you, you, you've got to do this they're very rigid the the world that i work in doesn't work like that i, I work with shift workers I work with people who there's an operational imperative for these people to be awake. And, and if they're not awake, it's dangerous. Like, so th there's certain jobs, there's certain roles where sleep deprivation is an un unfortunate byproduct, but, but we have to have it. Like ambulance drivers have to work at night. So, you know, they, they're going against the circadian rhythm. Certain people, like the police, the military, I, I, I they wouldn't listen to me if I said, you have to have a, a you know, Egyptian cotton sheets and blackout blinds and comfortable beds as wonderful as that would be it just doesn't work in these environments if you if you ever spent time you know on a submarine or you know th these places are not conducive to that sort of eight hours rest or, or you know wonderful sleep so what I try and do is is say well how do we optimize sleep when opportunities for sleep are not optimal how do we get the best out of a bad, bad situation what can we change to just make some make it slightly better and that that's the approach that i i try and take and there's a culture around sleep it's a you, it, it's about trying to convince people that sleep is is a is not a, a luxury like some people believe that it's the first thing that can go it's a luxury item i don't need it i can you know if i'm busy i can just cut my sleep back we have to we have to challenge that and say well no Sleep's the thing that is that is underpinning your your productivity. That it's it's not a luxury item. It should be prioritized. So it, that that that's how I, I kind of work. Um, mm. Yeah, there'll be a lot of military guys listening to this laughing because I presume that when you said <laughs> that the, that you're pushing back on the sleep aspect of training, uh, the brass just said flat out no. It's change. It's changing. It's changing. It's not 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 everywhere. You you do get some people who have got that old traditional. When I went through Sandhurst, I only got five hours, so you need to do that. No, there is that. There there are those those people who are um, have those traditions. I guess is the best way to describe it. But there, but there are others who will say, yeah, I only got five hours, and now they're open minded. So well. May, is there a different way is is there a, you know can we use the science can we use the evidence to 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 challenge some of those traditions and say is it is it better if we do it in a different way and i think if you go to basic training i mean this this is this is me my ideas my thoughts this is not representative of the mod but if you look at something like basic training what is the point what is the purpose of putting people through phase one training it's to 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 teach them you it's an educational pathway you are trying to help them learn so if we know that sleep is a foundational component of somebody's ability to learn and retain information then why are we sleep depriving them during that phase of their education surely that is the time when they get the most sleep and, and again, I'm not I'm not the, one of these people who saying the military should get the best sleep or because as I say, it, the reality is they're in a type of job where they will get restricted sleep. So at some point you have to get used to that. You have to be exposed to that. But there's a time and a place. And I think when sleep is used as an arbitrary punishment or a, a stress. So sometimes people will say we're going to sleep deprive individuals to see how they respond under stress. I would argue that that they won't be getting a very good response to stress that actually there are other ways of, of trying to see how people respond to stress and um, so you know there's sleep deprivation has a has a a role if that if i'm not sure if that's the right way of putting it i can see why people do that but there has to be a good reason to do it and it shouldn't just be because that's what i went through or i think it's a good way of of, of punishing somebody or you know or see seeing what they're like at their worst because you know fundamentally you are severely degraded when you're sleep deprived yeah 100 100 percent interestingly i was thinking that we, we used to have a, a like an sop a standard operating procedure 
when we were there, and we called it the 20 minute rule. If you knew you were going to be stationary for 20 minutes and it, and it wasn't a tactical situation. So you could just, we just pulled the sleeping bag out and got 20 minutes because we knew that how crucial that 20 minutes was. And it was very beneficial. And I totally agree with you about that was one of my, it wasn't a, I didn't, I never griped about it because it, what was the point? This was 20 years ago, but you know, if you want to, if the, the goal is for us to learn is to get the learning done, get the proper sleep. Cause I was going to say, when we'll, we'll talk about it. I want to ask you about this is the, the cognitive impairment you get from being sleep deprived. And, and, and then, you know, towards the end of the training, then we're going to put these guys through the mill and see how they see, see how they cope. And it does seem, it seems very counterintuitive. And you know, all I can remember from that time is, is I, I don't really remember much of it because I was basically out of my mind with exhaustion. Yep. You know, you don't remember a damn thing. Yeah. So uh, what's, what does it do? How does it cognitive, cognitively impair you? Mem- memory. Yep. Well, there <laughs> you go. For one. It's so, <laughs> it's, it's, number one. So it, well, when, when people are sleep deprived, we, we can look at what happens physically and what happens cognitively. And the interesting thing is physically you don't tend to see a lot. So what what I mean by that is sleep deprived people can still walk. They can still lift weights. They can put a load on their back and they can march. They can do a lot of the things that that you don't, your muscles don't lose their contractibility as a result of being sleep deprived. What happens is it feels harder. So your perception of effort, is affected when you're sleep deprived. So if you were to do a time to exhaustion test or like a loaded march, when fresh, you probably do it in a similar time, but the second, when when you're sleep deprived, it will just feel worse. So your perception of effort is, is changed when you are sleep deprived. So that's cognitive. Your perception of your effort is cognitive. And time itself, your perception of time becomes altered. Yeah. Because everything seems to take ages. It's, it's it's such a weird thing anyway sorry i carry on yeah so so physically you don't you don't see that much and i mean i've got I've, again i've got stories of, for example the ranger school in the united states a colonel who I've, I've did some work with who did some did some research on there he would talk about how like, the ranger school for people that don't know it's an arduous training route in the United States, isn't it? It's a it's a specialized infantry training route, um, very, very difficult and famous for, for for sleep deprivation. And he's got stories of these rangers who are they, they go through what they call droning. They call it the, the term is called droning. So they they can walk, they can march, but they're just drones. They, they, if you were to stop them and say which hand is left, which hand is right, they can't tell you, they can't read a map, they can't they're just so impaired all they can do is put one foot in front of the other and stories of they get they're they're instructed the most basic instruction just keep walking and watch the ranger eyes so the ranger eyes are two reflective strips on the back of the helmet of the person in front of them just keep your eye watch those ranger eyes follow those ranger eyes that's it and he's got stories of people like line uh, like a single file lineup of of these ranger candidates stationary you know, you say, why aren't you moving? Why aren't you marching? You go to the front of that of that stack and there's one individual who's staring at a tree because there's bioluminescent moss or fungi on the tree trunk <laughs> and, he, and he can't differentiate the tree trunk from a person. That's how sleep deprived these people are. Yeah. But they can still walk. They can move. They can, so, you know. I can recall the, one time in a similar sort of story, I was, we were, we basically were up in Thetford, which is in eastern part of England, southeast part of England. Uh, it's flat as a pancake, absolutely flat as a pancake. And they filmed the po- uh, uh, what was that? Oh, God, the other movie. I'll come back to that. That's, that was a deviation. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> um, Full Metal Jacket was filmed in Thetford. They used that for Vietnam. Did you know that? No. That's a big training area. Anyway, we were doing. We basically got there, dug trenches. It was horrendously wet and cold to the point it was snowing. But after it rained, then it snowed. And then after a, a night of sleep, when it was soaking wet, freezing cold, we got gassed. We did the, the gas attack, you know, the NBC um, 
drills, protocols and stuff. So you basically had to put on all the gear, the, the nuclear suit, NBC suit, the gloves, the, the boots and the mask. And someone, somebody had taken my mask and the mask was too big. So it didn't, it didn't seal on your face. And that's one of the reasons we don't have beards, like, unlike yourself, yeah. is because your gas mask won't fit so you won't get a proper seal. So I was, mine was, I had condensation in the inside and I had a tiny little, like a drop and that's all I could see through. So I was walking like that with one eye open, peering through to the person in front of me. And it was dark, of course. And uh, I, for me, I was walking along a ridge, an alpine ridge, like a knife edge, terrified I was going to fall. I was basically holding on to one of the straps because I was so terrified I was going to fall. So we stopped, eventually stopped and took off our masks and you look around and it's just flat. <laughs> <laughs> you can see for us, it's just the weirdest, weirdest thing. Um, so yeah, we're talking about sleep deprivation, but I want to get what I want to actually talk about because that was age, that was a different life for me. But you know, as I'm getting on in age, um, I've, I actually listened to a podcast, we talked about this before, um, Matthew Walker. Yep. He was on, I think he was on Joe Rogan. I think it was, I listened to three hours worth of him talking about it. And it was a bit doom and gloom because you think, right, well, you know, I have to be a monk and go to bed at eight o'clock at night and, you know, to get all the stuff I need to get done for the next day. Yep. You know, I can't go to sleep, sleep at 10, 11 o'clock at night, but I've subsequently learned that there's some good things from it and I don't eat, I, I have dinner and then I don't eat anything after, you know, dinner time, six, seven o'clock. And then that works, that works really well to be a slightly fasted. A cold room, which I always used to do anyway. And, you know, I've, I found I reap the benefits. So I'm actually quite rigorous to try and get, try and get eight hours. But I think I'm one of those pers people who just, I get to six and a half, seven hours, but that's it. My body wakes up and that's it. You know, there's not much, I, I can't get back to sleep unless I'm really tired to fall back asleep, but that's quite rare. So the thing about that is I also, and, and I'm very interested to hear what you think about this. I've recently, in the past couple of months, about two, three months ago, I, I stopped caffeine for uh, two months solid uh, without any caffeinated beverage, beverages at all, nothing. And I used to, I didn't, I wasn't much of a, I would have a coffee in the morning and that was it, maybe a cup of tea in the afternoon, but certainly no coffee after lunchtime for sure. Mm. And what I noticed first off was my dreams I got dreams again. That was a weird thing. And I don't, that's not much coffee. It's not like I was doing double espressos. It was just a regular coffee, but it did very much help my sleep. So what's your view on that and on the caffeine, the alcohol bit we can talk about as well after that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so ca caffeine is a psychoactive it's drug. It's a stimulant. It's the most commonly um, consumed psychoactive drug in, in the world. Worryingly, you know, our children, some children consume it. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a concern for me. For, I know I've got kids. So I don't want them consuming caffeine. Yeah. My, my parents, I used to get a cup of tea with sugar since I was two years old, probably young, yeah. from yeah. when I could. That, that, that's the least of the problems. It's more the, the energy drinks and that, you know, ah, the, right, yeah. the, oh, the volume terrible. of caffeine that in those yeah, drinks yeah. is horrendous. But anyway, that, that's probably a different conversation, Thank but um, so it's, it's a psychoactive substance. It, it's, it's a stimulant. So what caffeine is doing in your brain is it, it, it what how sleep is regulated broadly speaking is you, your sleep is controlled by two physiological systems. Um, it's, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but if we think of two systems, one of them is called your sleep pressure, which sometimes known as sometimes call it a sleep drive or a, a homeostatic drive to sleep that builds that's building up throughout the day. So from the moment you wake up, it's building up, building up. The more you're awake, the higher this pressure. And then when you fall asleep at night, you wash away that pressure. So think of it like thirst. It's this is a similar homeostatic drive. If you don't drink anything, your thirst builds up and up and up and you get thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. And then when you down a pint of water, you quench that thirst. So now that feeling of thirstiness is gone. Sleep is a similar thing. It builds, it builds, it builds. You sleep, it washes it away. So that's one of those systems. The other one is our circadian rhythm, our circadian alerting system. So we've evolved on a planet that has a regular sun up, sun down schedule. So we have adapted our physiology to to live on that in on on this planet. 
So we are alert when the sun is up and we are not alert when the sun is down. So we are uh, we, we are a diurnal species. We are awake when the sun is up. So those two things into in, like they push against each other and pull against each other. So what's happening is, as your your circadian rhythm is dipping as the sun goes down towards the end of the of the evening, you're not getting light exposure into your eyes. Your your circadian rhythm or nervous system dips at the same point that your sleep pressure is peaking, and you get this golden window where the, those two things align and you and you fall asleep. That's that's how we've evolved to to work that that's what nature has given us now what what's happening with sleep pressure with some people is is we can do things that interrupt that build up of, of sleep pressure and what and sleep pressure is it's it's a chemical it's a chemical thing it's we have substances in our body that build up we call them somnogens somnogens there's lots of them but probably the most commonly studied uh, or well known is a somnogen called adenosine. Adenosine basically slows things down. Like it, so, the more adenosine, the slower everything. So it's in your brain as it goes into your brain, into your, into your, your, the electrically active part of your brain, your neurons. Adenosine will create uh, or, or initiates a biochemical cascade that's slowing things down, and, and you're falling asleep. Now, by some quirk of nature, the adenosine molecule is the same shape as a caffeine molecule. So if you imagine like a lock and a key, what's happening with adenosine is, is, the, is the key and it's going into the lock, which is what we call a receptor. It's a adenosine receptor. So that's, as the key goes into the lock, that biochemical cascade happens, everything slows, everything calms down, you fall asleep. Now, but this quirk of nature, the caffeine key is the same shape as the adenosine key. So it can go into the same receptor, the same lock. So what's happening is caffeine is stopping adenosine from working the way it should do. It's blocking that adenosine getting into its receptor site. So that slowing isn't happening. So you're just maintaining that same level. So what's happening is your sleep pressure is not allowed to build because caffeine is interrupting that process. So that's why if people consume caffeine uh, you know, relatively late in the evening, is they're having that they're, they're stopping the adenosine they're stopping the sleep pressure from building and, it, and it, that's keeping them awake it's maintaining that alertness so that's what from a from a chemical and neurochemical perspective that's what uh, caffeine is doing it's just preventing um, adenosine from working the way it should and what some people then experience is what we call a caffeine crash so the caffeine that's in those receptors has been metabolized it's been broken down all that adenosine that's been that had been building up has now could suddenly flood in and, and it causes that, that sudden sensation of, of, of crashing, of feeling terrible. Um, so that, that's, that's what's happening there. So just on, just on that, I know yeah. my wife is a Swedish, so we spend quite a lot of time in Sweden, in Sweden and they, I mean, they consume coffee all day long, strong coffee. And I have friends and I, I told them, because I said, oh, listen to that podcast. Now I'm a sleep expert. So I said to them, you know, you understand what this is doing to you. And, he said, and they all say the same thing. I said, I have, they say, I have no problem falling asleep. Yep. And I said, yes, but, and this is how I described it. And I'd like you to give it, to, to talk about it properly, is that that sleep you get is of a, a lower quality, which means when you wake up in the morning, you, you're still not rested properly. Therefore, you need coffee again in the morning. And then that cycle continues and continues and for most of them it's for a lifetime that mm. they, they don't give up and I, and I suggest you should maybe cut down or give up caffeine and they just say absolutely not well it's a drug right it's you, you get withdrawal symptoms people, people who well, stop yeah. taking caffeine experience withdrawal symptoms it, it's well that's it's, what happened it, to me for about a day I had like a mild dull a very 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 mild but I can a dull ache in the middle of my center of my brain yeah you know that's what how it felt but I've also heard stories of people who cut cut it out cold turkey mm. and that's and they were getting migraines and felt terrible and sick and got fluey and anyway yeah. but you, yeah. please t tell us more about it because that's what I that's what I've how I how I thought of it that that's what the cause was is it was because then it was you're into a vicious cycle and I think it's the same probably the same with alcohol we can talk about that as well 
Yeah, yeah. So with with caffeine, there's there's the way that your body processes caffeine, the the enzymes and things that you that break it down. Different. You have different levels of it. You have different. Di- me and you will metabolize caffeine at different rates at different speeds. So some people can can take on a lot of caffeine and have very little um, effect. Some people metabolize it really quickly. Some people can have a very small amount of caffeine. I, I remember doing an experiment when I was over in Canada working at a university. We did um, with, with students I was working with. They they had to they had to design a study, design an experiment, and they they did one with caffeine. They they used a caffeine tablet. There was something like a hundred milligrams of caffeine in it, so not not much more than a normal cup of coffee one of the students did not drink caffeine didn't consume caffeine they take that one tablet of 100 milligrams and he was physically shaking you could see him almost having palpitations in front of your eyes so there's there's a there's a real range of uh, response to caffeine um, just, just genetics uh, uh, determine a lot of it but then so does habits so you become habituated to caffeine. So you, the more you have, the more you will be able to have. So you will, your dose will go up and up and up. So what you tend to find is that people who are habituated, who drink a lot of caffeine, start to lose the alerting effects of caffeine. So they don't get that buzz, that stimulation. Um, and, they, and they're the people who say, I can drink and it's six espressos at 10 p.m. and I can fall asleep. Yes, you can because you've lost that alerting buzz. But what it what the what, what you're not recognizing is that it, it's having an effect on your brain. It is affecting your brain. Whether you have, where you've got that subjective sensation of alertness, the caffeine has it is an effect is affecting your brain. So what's happening? The, a myth around sleep that I think some people have that I've certainly heard is that sleep is a passive state that it's like power down that you you are your eyes are closed you're not you no longer interacting with your environment typically you're lying down so you know you've got what we call a tonia your muscles are um you know you, you're relaxed so people think of it as, as passive but if we study the, the 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 sleeping human in fact if we study the sleeping animal any all our organisms have a especially mammals at least have very clear um, signs of sleep we can look at the brain we can actually study what's happening in the brain through the electrical activity so we can use a technology called an eeg which is effectively i'm I'm, with a bald head i can show you how to do it but you stick these electrodes onto the brain or onto the skull and what those electrodes are doing are picking up the electrical activity from from the brain different areas different regions of the brain and then we can also look at the electrical activity around the muscles of your eyes, um, maybe on your chin. And um, they sometimes put a, a strap across your chest. So all in this, is, this is something called a polysomnography. So it's poly because multiple, many, and the somnography is just a way of measuring sleep. So what you see when people are asleep, the brain waves are are very identifiable, and you can stage people. You can put people in, into what we call sleep stages. And those sleep stages are relatively well known. So the REM sleep stage is, is what most people know. It stands for rapid eye movement. Hence why we measure the electrical activity of the muscles around the eye. Because we, when those muscles, are, are when the eyes are moving, we know people are in REM sleep combined with certain things in your brain. We also have what we call non-REM sleep or NREM. And there are three different types. The stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage three is sometimes known as slow wave or deep sleep. So those are the stages. That's what we call our sleep architecture. And the size of those waves or the, what we call the amplitude or the frequency of those waves, we can use that to, to help us understand which stage of sleep somebody's in. There are certain characteristics of the, of the, of the electrical activity of the brain you can, that can help identify what stage you're in. What's happening when you're having caffeine is it's affecting that electrical activity of the brain. So that the, when you say the quality of sleep is affected, what's really happening is your sleep stages, the, um, the strength of the, of the brain waves are affected because of caffeine. And your brain, you, your sleep stages, is very similar to, to nutrition. It's similar to a diet. Like a good diet 
should have some carbohydrates, some fats. You need, to, you need these macronutrients, you need the micronutrients, and you kind of need a balance. And if any of them are missing, you start to see deficiencies. You start to see problems in terms of, you know, um, if you're not getting enough fats in your diet, then you don't produce certain um, vitamins, for example. So we need it all. So the same thing with sleep stages, we need them all. And what happens when you start taking caffeine and, and, and alcohol as well has a similar effect is it starts to affect certain stages uh, and reduces the, the, the restorative effect of those stages. So the, the, the long and short is, I mean, my, I, I know people, you go around to the house and it's all oh, stick the kettle on. It's like it's nine o'clock at night and they thought, I'll get you a coffee. But those people, they, they've lost the alerting boost, in, boost of caffeine because they're habituated, but it is having an effect on their brain, uh, their sleep architecture. It's one of my favorite things to do now, Martin, is actually say, tell people, you should, you know, you should just give it up. Try giving up and the look you get. It's like there's absolutely no chance yeah. at all. I, I, say I that. caffeine. I take. I. I. I, I consume coffee. Uh, I, I drink tea. Uh, the, my my approach is. I don't. I, I understand why people would would want to give it up. One of the things that I think is important to recognise is caffeine is performance enhancing. It's it's useful for certain situations. So what I try and uh, what I advocate personally is is think of caffeine strategically, not habitually. So use it as a tool. It is a very effective tool to keep you alert when you need it, but it's not if you've overused it. It's it does it. For example, caffeine helps you um, to, to when you're oxidizing fat when you're doing the endurance exercise. Caffeine's really useful. It's a performance enhancing substance, but it starts to lose its effect if you overuse it or you abuse it. So I I don't say don't like I, I'm not an advocate of completely cutting caffeine, although I understand why you'd want to and you know it makes sense but for certain roles certain jobs the kind of people that i work with it's a tool it's a it's a very effective tool and um, that i think people can use yeah well again yeah. i i gave it a try because i i was persuaded to by a friend and i thought well i'll give it a shot see how it is and i thought okay it wasn't it wasn't nearly as tough to come off it as i thought it was but i didn't drink that much in the first place uh, the second thing was I thought maybe after a few days that I'd have a craving and I had zero cravings at all. The only thing I missed was the, my morning ritual, mm. you know, the ritual of you know, the smell and the taste and yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I'd still do. And I, and I do, maybe I might have one every week or every two weeks. And it's usually because if I slept badly or I got woken up because I got kids yeah. and, or whatever, I just had a bad night's sleep. So, and, and, sometimes because i i'm at a certain age now where i like to have a drink but i can't drink very much and if i do drink more than i should i'm i'm baggage for a couple of days later and it doesn't i mean i'm i'm talking four pints instead of three a beer or you know a bottle of wine instead of half a bottle of wine that's what I'm, level i'm talking at and sometimes even more and then a coffee the next day really does help funny that funny enough <laughs> and um yeah so that brings me on to the to the alcohol aspect yep about how devastating alcohol is for your sleep. Yeah. And it was, and it was when you, I remember when I heard it before, cause I, you know, you think oh, I'll take a, a nightcap. Remember that in the old days, let's have a yeah. nightcap before we go to bed. Yeah. It's common still. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not a, the old days. People still do that. Yeah. Get a whiskey, <laughs> a big whiskey or a brandy and get that down your neck and then go to bed. But when I, when I since I've found out about it, it, how it really, because it's a, it's a depressant, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and it messes your sleep up bad. So please yep. give us the scientific breakdown of that as well. Yeah, sure. This is, so, going, to be, this is going to be a horror show for people listening to this. Then, yeah. absolute so, killjoy, Mr. Kindness. It's um, so I'll, as you, you you're exactly right. It's it's a, it's a central nervous system depressant. So it, 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 if we again we think like it acts in a similar way to denazine, it's like it slows things down. It, it's a depressant means it doesn't make you sad. A depressant just means it's 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 slowing things down. So it's reducing activity. So the this idea of a nightcap, um, it, it and alcohol helps me get to sleep. There is some truth in that. It it does help you get to sleep. But well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually change what I'm saying. It 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 sedates you. It, it so 
this is where we need to think of you know what's the difference between um someone who's in a coma and someone who's asleep someone who's been in who's been knocked out and somebody who's asleep like they're not the same thing they look the same so for, in terms of the behavior somebody who's concussed you know has been you know who's knocked out they look the same as someone who's asleep their eyes are typically closed they're usually lying down they're not moving they're not responding to environment but one of them's a brain injury and one of them's a perfectly normal even you know it's, well, it's not even it is an essential biological process but they look the same so so what's happening with alcohol is it, it is sedating you so you're entering a period of sedation versus what we call physiological sleep so as i said those sleep the sleep architecture that i discussed it's a it's a beautifully um, beautifully elegant system that happens in your brain of neurons switching on switching off neurotransmitters moving up moving down this this orchestra of, of neurotransmitters which is creating this thing we call sleep and it's, it's it's changing throughout the night alcohol is mimicking that but it's not doing the same thing so you are you are putting your eyes are now closed and you're not responding to the environment but you're not in the same sort of physiological sleep so we we can see we can see this really clearly with um like some wearable technologies i know some people like to use wearable technologies there's there's a measurement called heart rate variability that measures the kind of the beat to beat variability and you can see that when people consume alcohol that they tend to have a much lower heart rate variability which is indicative of a, of a, of the simple well reduced parasympathetic nervous system activation so stress let's call it stress and um, so you, you, alcohol is, is it upping that that sort of that stress level and um, from a central nervous system perspective but then it's also just like caffeine is interrupting those sleep stages alcohol is as well it, 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 they just interrupt different sleep stages so almost i remember that i haven't touched one of these for years and i didn't have them very often but i remember as a student the the old you know the vodka red bull Vodka you know, fruities, yeah, I remember yeah, those very well. Yeah, just think, well. I mean, that's that's just the it's got <laughs> it's got the caffeine and the and the, and the alcohol. It's just the worst you can imagine. So you're interrupting your slow wave sleep and you're up to interrupting your REM sleep. It's just the worst thing you could consume. But that 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 alcohol tends to do that. It shortens your REM period, REM sleep period. So REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, is involved in lots of things. Um. W- to say, you know, what's the purpose of REM sleep is a tricky question. What we know is when people don't get sufficient REM sleep, they tend to be more irritable. They they, they find it harder to, to regulate their emotions. Their learning capacity is impaired. And so they, these selective sleep stage restrictions, you see certain uh, declines, like specific areas of cognitive performance decline more than others. So, yeah, it, it there's no no shadow of a doubt alcohol does impair your 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 sleep um, yeah because anyone who knows who's gone on a a boy's holiday or a girl's holiday or whatever and you're drinking every night it doesn't have to be much uh when you get back the first night's sleep is usually terrible when you when you're actually not drunk and then what i know is certainly for me is that then after that i get the the, the rem the dreams come back hard very hard and you you know you start having some wild and crazy dreams it's it's just so fascinating isn't it and here's me thinking that when you fall asleep at night your soul goes traveling through the universe you know (laughs) much more to it than that yeah maybe it just keeps you here maybe it keeps you here instead you're the the expert um we we, things we can't measure we don't know if they happen or not so who knows so why is it then professor that i've got now i've got a proper one to speak to when, I, when we were young, student days in our 20s, up until probably our early 30s when it started to hit you, where you could party hard, drink caffeine, eat bad food, and get wake up next day not fresh as a daisy in your early 20s, let's say. But yeah. as it goes on, it gets worse. What's the, What causes that? Because now I'm entering, well, let's call it middle age. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to even say that word, but sadly, that's where I am at right now. But when you got, like for, for myself, I've actually 
when I was young, I didn't need a lot. I felt like I didn't need much sleep. Five, six hours and I was, I was fine. I could, I could, I was good with that. Yeah. But now I'm really conscious to try and get as much sleep as possible. So I'll go to bed early. Yeah. I'll maybe listen to a book. That's probably a bad thing, but we can talk about that as well. Uh, or, or a podcast. And then I, I kind of just fall asleep. It's one of the things that people, it's actually one of the nicest and most hurtful things people say to me is when they listen to the podcast is, oh yeah, I listen to you at night when I fall asleep. And it's nice that they listen, but <laughs> they just use it. For, anyway. <laughs> so I'd take that as a compliment. If well, I actually do I'm take it as a compliment. facilitating their performance. But it's got a little, it's got a little, a wee slightly bitter aftertaste to it, but it's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is it? Why is it as we get older, our sleep I, well apparently we need less sleep when we get older which okay. I, i'm well, let, but... I can, let's address that first go for it so, well i'll ask you a question how many hours of sleep do you need per night i would say my usual and this is this is my body not me you know without any stimulant you know no caffeine or alcohol or anything like that i would probably get s between six and eight hours sleep okay so well, that's what you get but what do you need what what do you what would what's the magic number? I've got a number in my head that most people, people listening might have this number in their head. Well, I mean, people say you need your solid eight. Eight, but yeah. Yeah. I would, if I do sleep longer than eight hours, I feel good. That's no 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 doubt about that. But perhaps it's because I'm used to waking up at say seven o'clock or six o'clock, yeah. whatever whatever I'm my cycle is at that time. My body will wake up usually around about that time. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's that should happen so the, the eight hours let's just discuss eight hours and maybe debunk eight hours where it's come from so if you were to take so let's talk about sleep need how many hours do you need not how many hours do you like to get or do you prefer or do you you know you think makes you more productive what do you physiologically need so we talked about sleep pressure how long does it take to wash away that sleep pressure how long is your circadian rhythm the genes you, you've got you've got certain genes that that are involved in circadian rhythm you know you can't change that so how long do you need so people say eight hours so where's that come from so if we, if we took the entire population in the uk and we we were able to somehow quantify sleep need which is not an easy thing to do even dare i even say possible thing to do but let's just imagine we can we would we would get a normal distribution so that's like that what we think of as a bell curve um sort of like a lump in the middle with the, the tails go out to the other end and if we look at that axis of of the proportion of a, of a population and then how many hours eight would be in the middle so eight hours is the mean um, of a population the average but the the tails exist like there, there is a there's a roundabout a, a two-thirds of a population are within what we call one standard deviation of either side of the mean so roughly let's call it a range of seven to nine hours most of the population will need somewhere between that but then there are some people who need who can get away with six some people need 10 some people need f like maybe four maybe five but because we're now on those tails the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller so the people that have a genuine sleep need of four hours is, is really small it's probably a one percent of the population maybe less than that but the the state because it's a normal distribution it's it's a symmetrical distribution this there's the same number of people who really need 13 14 hours very few people think of themselves needing 14 but somehow there's this you know this sleepless elite get four it's almost a, a badge of honor having less sleep so people tend to claim that they sit on the other side but it's a, the mean is an average means that there will be people who are above that there will be people below that so if, if if i give you another example and say well what's your shoe size you know the mean shoe size in the uk is a size eight i'm not a size eight i don't know if you maybe you're not a size eight so if we then go around um to all the local shoe shops in the in the country and say you should only stock size eight shoes because that is the national average people are not going to have comfortable shoes so that this is what happens with sleep is we have this belief that eight hours is what we should be aiming for but it, it's not 
for everybody. It's for some people, they will need eight, but it's the average number. So there will always be people who need more. There'll always be people who need less. So the, 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 your body will determine how much sleep you need based on how long it takes to clear away that sleep pressure and your circadian rhythm. So if you, if you need 10 hours, if you, if you don't set an alarm and, and you're able to, there's no social cues that are going to wake you up in the morning, like your kids needing breakfast or the dog needing to go out to the toilet, whatever. And um, this is just my life, maybe. Um, like how long would you, would you get? And, and, and another way, another question or way of finding out is put your mobile phone away, go out. I live close to Dartmoor, go out onto Dartmoor, do some wild camping where you've got natural light exposure, you've got no phone, you've got no, nothing like that. And how long do you sleep in those environments? Like uh, when some of the people I work with go out to, a, to the jungle, they report the best sleep they ever have because they, they are then determined by this environment that they're in. They've got no um, extraneous variables that are interrupting their sleep and they get, they often get more than what they think they need. And that's just their, their body is resetting. So eight hours is a myth I'm just, i think that's that's the first thing it's it, it's um it's a useful number but it's not for everybody it's better to think of ranges that most people would need somewhere between seven and nine hours i think so how come for when i was a late teens early 20s i could sometimes sleep i think 14 hours is my record i had a guy who slept for 24 hours a guy in was it 20 21 or 24 hours anyway a huge amount of sleep uh, and, but then as soon as I, kind of hit my early, early twenties and I had to get up early because I joined the army, um, yeah, I went straight down. It, it just dropped to, yeah. you know, as it is, is pretty much what it is now. Yeah. I think you, the younger people tend to be a bit more robust to, to, to acute sleep restriction. I think, I mean, I'm not sure there's there's much data on it. it like it's more of a hunch than evidence base, if i'm honest but i think that your your sleep need does change as you as you age your circadian rhythm changes as you age so from you from from i mean if you look at newborn babies and say i've got two kids and then they're a bit older now but i remember newborn babies sleep a lot as you, as, you, as anyone who's got kids will know 24 well 22 hours of the day they're asleep and they've they're they've they we go back to the stages they don't have the same staging that, that adults do they are REM sleep dominant so they're almost entirely REM sleep when the, the newborns as, as children age you know my six-year-old she will sleep much longer than I do my 10-year-old is starting to reduce her sleep time already as they get into the as they become teenagers their sleep need will, will start to solidify a bit more. It'll get slightly shorter, but their circadian rhythm is changing. So they, they will, we have a, we have a, a phrase, some people are called a larks or owls. Are you more of a morning type? You're more of an evening type. It's what's called an advanced phase or a delayed phase. Teenagers, because their circadian rhythm is still Sort of forging developing setting whatever the whatever the phrase you really want to use but it, it's it's in a it's a period of flux so they are, are typically a bit more delayed phase they're a bit more evening so so teenagers adolescents just because of what's happening in their brain it's a adolescence is this time of immense change so things will happen change in their sleep as well but they are, are becoming phase delayed so that's why anyone who's got teenagers their kids aren't lazy it's not that they're, they're, they're just hanging around in bed all day if, if you ask a, a 14 year old to wake up at seven o'clock in the morning it's not a million miles different to asking an adult to wake up at three o'clock in the morning it will feel very similar just because they're having this phase shifting so once you get into your 20s it's now sort of solidified a bit bit more and then for most of your adulthood it should be relatively stable and then as you get into older adulthood, you might get a slight change. Your circadian rhythm starts to blunt a little bit. Um, and then you, more than anything, you've then got lifestyle issues around aging that can interrupt sleep. So pain um, for women who menstruate, the menopause will affect sleep um, for, for the vast majority of those women. Maybe 
for men of a certain age, the need to go to the toilet a lot because um, of various, you know, urine that, problems. That goes away. So here's another one for you. That goes away when you don't drink alcohol or coffee, yeah. by the way. Yeah. FYI. Don't, don't consume any liquid past a certain time. Yeah. And you won't necessarily need to that's, go to the that's, toilet. That's also very true. Yeah. But um, so you do start to see, you, you know, you do see age related change in sleep. Um, but, but it's not, it, it, it it's not that you know as a as an 18 year old i needed four hours now as a 44 year old i need 14 hours that that would be quite strange what would what would that what would suggest to me is that as an 18 year old on four hours you were just hanging on by your fingernails that you're able to deal with it um whereas actually you did need more you were just a bit a your your lifestyle meant that you could adapt um that maybe the cognitive decline wasn't noticeable because that's the job that you were doing or the phase of your life that it wasn't it wasn't having a huge impact on your on your every day here's a weird thing i've noticed lately is when i get so last year uh, because i've got a couple of you know they bring bringing this diseases back from school so i, I get I mean, with the virus whatever it was hit us all last week so Friday, I was at, you know, both kids were at home, one home from school, and I, you know, I couldn't go to work. I was not feeling great, and I couldn't have gone anyway because, you know, what's, you know, the kids were at home. So I was, I was a bit annoyed because the day before, the night before, the two nights before that, even though I was tired, I could not sleep, and that's now an indicator for me that, and I say I could not sleep. It took me ages to get to sleep, probably one, two in the morning, and then, so I was only getting maybe four or five hours sleep which is kind of for me is counterintuitive because you'd think that when you're sick you would need you want to have more sleep yeah so i don't that doesn't make any sense to me is that that's, something you come across before so that, that's typical so you so uh, i mentioned before Good. these um these somnogens that i'd mentioned before so adenosine is the one that we know a lot about we study a lot but there are other somnogens so are the what we call interleukins and prostaglandins these like immune factors so so the more that they those things are can initiate sleep or can, can drive up that that drive to sleep so when you're when you're fighting an infection if you've got some kind of biological assault on you on your systems it you you often will get you often need more sleep um in order to 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 fight off that infection um so what can some you sometimes get a bit of a rebound you, you can have a rebound where you, you might have had that infection then you're kind of just resetting and, and that then you get like a little transient insomnia i mean it probably isn't i wouldn't even classify it as insomnia just a transient difficulty falling asleep because insomnia is a disorder it, it's you know it's many many days over many weeks but having that initial sort of just bounce back of uh, you know just resetting your system getting helping you get back to normal i'd say is, is not not something that would be abnormal okay well that's good to hear because it was annoying me but it's a good i know then i can prepare i can start loading up on the, the minerals yeah. and vitamins and stuff that i need it, i mean it could be it could be behavioral so it could be as i said before this kd rhythm is really important in setting your your, your sleep wake cycle and, and your circadian rhythm it's an endogenous rhythm it, it ticks over whether you're in a submarine, if you're in a cave, you know, if you're not getting what we call these Zeitgebers, these, these, so Zeitgeber is a German word, mean time giver. So the sunlight, the outdoor helps to set your rhythm. It helps to entrain your rhythm to the environment. And so what can sometimes happen when you're ill, you don't go outside. So you, you could be actually interfering with your circadian rhythm because you're now not physically active. You're not, so exercise can be another one of those Zeitgebers. Maybe you're not eating because you're ill or you're not eating at the same times. So what's happening is maybe over that period of illness, it's actually the behavioral components of sleep that are, or, or components of wakefulness to be more accurate, that are then having a knock on effect on your sleep because you know, you're just not getting that light exposure. You're not getting exercise. You're not getting social interaction. Um, you're not consuming nutrients at the same time. So it might not be, that you need to go out and buy supplements and take nutrients. It's just get back out into the sun at a regular time and reset your clock that way. I live in a place where you get it's approximately 300 days of sun a year. 
although the last few weeks has been very cloudy and pretty crap weather. But regardless, um, I was going to ask you, because, you know, that's an hour already and we didn't even talk about anything about human performance, but the sleep <laughs> discussion is... Sleep is the foundation of human Well, it, there you go. That's that's <laughs> step one. That's the yeah. first pillar. Yeah. I, I, have to, I have to say, this is... It's so interesting. I'm. It's, it's an hour has just flown past. Are you okay for maybe another five, 10 minutes? Yeah, Is sure. That, okay, cool. So there's one thing I used to take. I haven't, I ran out of it basically. Melatonin. I used to take a, a, a 10 milligrams of melatonin. Not not every night, but sometimes I would take it. But then I found out it was actually meant to be beneficial for your, oh, is it for hormone development or something? I don't know. What's What's your view on melatonin? So melatonin is a, is a hormone. It's produced um, by your pineal gland in, in your brain naturally. So you, it, it's sometimes known as the hormone of darkness or the vampire hormone. It's got various names, but it, it it's it it's produced when you stop getting light in your eyes. So you've got a, a system that it, within your eyes, a type of cell in your retina. It's almost like a solar panel sort of. Um, in your eyes that it's not not involved in vision per se but it's taking in the quality of the light it's then going into a part of your brain that's registering that light that then loops to your pineal gland to release melatonin melatonin then acts like this the starter pistol of a race that, that, that initiates sleep so it it's it some some researchers actually say it's not really a sleep hormone at all what it's actually probably doing is just reducing core body temperature it might be more of a thermoregulatory hormone so when you sleep you need to drop your body temperature um but that's part of what what happens when we sleep we, we lower our, our body temperature and then we go to sleep so melatonin is involved in that so do so do you need to take it um as a tablet if your body's already producing it so the, so some people will opt to use melatonin as a sleep aid it with the belief that it will actually help initiate sleep there's there's not great evidence that it's it's a very it's not an effective treatment for insomnia for example it can be used for certain things that some again some individuals will use it when they're going across different time zones so if to avoid jet lag it can be used for that thing for that that purpose but in a similar way that we've talked about caffeine there are individual differences in how people respond to melatonin. So it doesn't work for a lot of people at all. And um, some people swear by it. I personally don't use melatonin. So if I'm going to go through um, different time zones, if I'm traveling around the world, I just use light. I, I'll, I'll, re, I'll help to re-entrain my circadian rhythm by using um, what we call a sad lamp, um, like a light therapy lamp. So you can use melatonin, but there are better ways. Uh, there are better um they're better treatments for insomnia for one the the melatonin much better treatments the non-pharmacological treatments and if you were using it to facilitate jet or reduce jet lag again there's probably better ways of doing it so i i personally don't use melatonin so what are the treatments for insomnia um so the gold standard is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia ah so you've got to go to a specialist you can't just do it on your own you, well, yes and no. That you, a specialist is the gold standard. Like, if you know, if you go into an expert um, to take you through that process, would be the best way of doing it. But then there are other ways. You know, there are books, there are self help books, there are apps. Um, there are you can use web web based um, uh, programs. So there are group group therapies. There are lots of different ways. But going to see a specialist is is a good way of doing it. But the reality is there aren't that many of them um, particularly in the united kingdom and there's a cost involved in, in a one-to-one -one support with a therapist but fundamentally what what we what you do with cognitive behavioral therapy is it's not the so cbt cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is not this is not the therapy that you're using that people use to deal with depression anxiety even though it's sound it's cognitive behavioral therapy when it's for insomnia, it's very specific. So it's not it's not treating a mood disorder. It's it's treating sleep problems. It's very specific for sleep, and you 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 the 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 approach is trying to 
change some of the beliefs around sleep, some of the attitudes and thoughts that might be interfering with sleep. It's looking at some of those behavioral things, like I said before, like light exposure um, or, you know, some of the things around bedtime, you know, trying to use the bedroom as the place for sleep. It's not your office. It's not your gym. It's where you go to bed. So you're reforging that relationship between your sleep environment and the act of sleeping. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's an, it's a series of therapies. It's a group of therapies that are that are, that are evidence based, and 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 very, there's very very strong evidence for them um, in treating insomnia. Uh, so, sleeping pills, various drugs that so we have different classes of drugs. They they do in a similar way to alcohol. They sedate. They will. They 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 do put you into a similar state to sleep, but they have a side effect profile cbti doesn't yeah. and it lasts for longer so th that's that's the gold standard approach is is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia all right well let's finish on a, a happy note shall we say what's give me what what would be your your gold standard sleep hygiene your sleep routine before you go to bed what would what's the ideal thing to do the steps well, you take rather yeah, yeah I'll tell you sure. what's not a good ideal thing to do is sit with a bright light in front and right in your eyes when you're filming and you're recording <laughs> things like this that's yeah. that's not good <laughs> yeah that's a good point so no, so number one so first first off i'd, I'd, I'd maybe offer a, a challenge is is sleep the end of the day or is sleep the start of the day so do we, is it the last thing you do or is it the first thing you do so I, I try and think of well, sleep is actually the start of the day. It's a thing I'm doing first. It's setting up the rest of the day. So that's that. That's how I approach it straight off the bat. So then, when I wake up, I'm almost I've already gone through my start of the day, my preparation, which is sleep. So I'm now thinking, well, how do I make sure that the next sleep phase is is, is good? So my sleep hygiene routine, if you want to call it that doesn't start an hour before i go to bed it starts the minute i wake up so i get outside so my my number one is i get at least half an hour of exercise and light exposure and and you say you know, if it's if it's a cloudy day outside that doesn't matter the the quality of the light even in the uk with it's gray and cloudy it's still sufficient to to help in train skating with them so that's what that is my non-negotiable like every day i get outside um and i get light exposure and um, it's not i'm not thrashing myself up and up over dartmoor or going for a four-hour bike ride it's walking the my daughters to school it's walking the dog it, you know it's it's low intensity physical activity to say exercise is probably not quite true it's, it's, it's just being physically active in the presence of sunlight so that that's a, that's a non-negotiable. That helps me set my circadian rhythm. If I can't do that, like if I'm traveling, or you know, there's there's sometimes there's a reason why I can't do it. I I do I notice it. So it's something that I I, I try and get in every single day. I try and remain physically active. So my routine is not just like a day to day. I think being physically healthy is something that underpins good sleep so i try to eat well try and have a balanced diet i try and be physically active and i don't over consume stimulants i don't smoke and um, so nicotine is another stimulant that interrupts sleep i don't vape i don't smoke never have done um i do consume caffeine but i don't consume it after lunchtime typically and um, for me caffeine takes about eight hours to, to clear out of my system just through trial and error that's kind of what i figured out so I don't consume caffeine after lunch. And then towards the evening, I'll try and do re relatively relaxing things. I will often watch films. I'll sometimes read. Um, I'm, I'm currently <laughs> I'm running 5K every day at the moment. And with everything else going on, I'm having to do that in the evening. So I'm, I'm actually probably not doing the best thing. And I'm doing physical activity and exercise too late. Probably shouldn't be doing that. But it's not affecting me so far so so far so good and um, but yeah just try and do things relatively relaxing Um, i don't have a regular bedtime like some people will say you have to go to bed same time every single day i go to bed when i'm tired 
So when I feel when I have that sensation of t of tiredness, I go to bed. Same, absolutely the same. Yeah. And so, what about a cold room? We we don't have a cold room. We don't have a hot house either. Like we, uh, I think our thermostat's set for eighteen degrees centigrade. Oh wow! Well, that's okay. Just, that's a cold room. Yeah, that's our house. <laughs> so we're yeah. uh, trying to reduce in our carbon footprint as well. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't, we certainly don't have a hot a hot a hot house um you go to sweden and like scandinavian, scandinavian countries the houses are just insufferably hot yeah that was same in canada you know where i lived in canada it was regularly minus 40 outside so the, the inside was always baking hot um, where were you just in, Ed, in edmonton uh, well there you go uh, yeah north of calgary that's a that's a cool place yeah it was i know that uh listen martin we haven't even again an hour and a bit is not enough for these kind of subjects but it's been absolutely fascinating and i really appreciate it because this is this is really good quality information for people because i think sleep is very much misunderstood and i hope we haven't put people off because that would be you know enjoy your caffeine enjoy your alcohol etc but try not to do it before you know before bedtime i guess is what we say yeah but it's just it's such a it's only re I can only really think of it happening in the last couple of years that people start talking about sleep and how important it is. And I know I, I'm very strict with my kids to get them to, to sleep, to go to bed as much as possible at the same time and get 11, 12 hours a night because I think that's probably the most important thing for kids. I'm, I'm sure you agree with that. I hope you agree with that. Anyway. 100%, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so it's... They're, they're you could, I mean, at that stage of life, their brains are developing so quickly and sleep is creating the conditions for that development like if you don't allow children to get sufficient sleep the the, the brains just can't the, the conditions for their brain growth and development are just not there so yeah for kids it's it, it, it's hugely important yeah oh i'm glad you said that too it's weird when you go on holiday if you go like if you're in spain or italy or somewhere in the mediterranean countries and the kids are up at midnight uh, I, young kids and i think mm. that i just I'm, I, what are you doing you know you <laughs> need to get some sleep but listen maybe we can do this in a you know we'll go revisit in a, in a a few months or a year down the line and and um we'll talk a bit more about this because i really want to talk about the, the human performance aspect but as you said yep. we've covered the first and most important pillar yeah and uh, i very much appreciate it and hopefully we're going to see each other soon in january i think yep. we're maybe meeting up and that'd yeah, be a lot so. of fun very much looking forward to that. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on, mate. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye-bye.